Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time that we have together. We thank you once again, uh, Lord, that we have this place uh, to come to, this building, uh, this house. And most of all, Lord, we just thank you for those who are around us, uh, who continue to invest in our lives, who have uh, continued to be uh, open uh, before us, Lord, all wanting to draw closer uh, to you. And so, uh, Lord, we just ask that you would uh, speak to our hearts today, uh, Lord, that you would allow us to just share your love amongst one another, all for your glory. And we're just trusting you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, uh, this morning, we had talked uh, a few weeks ago when, when we were uh, talking about Christmas, talking about the wise men who weren't at the manger scene as we picture it and we see it in yards, but the wise men were coming to see Jesus. And it might even be a couple years uh, before they actually made it to where the baby Jesus uh, was growing up at that time in a house. They came from a, a long way off and they were on camels and they would come across the desert. Actually, I don't know if camels were mentioned, but they would come across the desert and uh, on the way uh, they would have this journey to take. And so, so we had uh, talked about the fact that as we go through the gospel, as we go through the scriptures, as we study God's word, uh, sometimes it's nice to think about that, uh, to take a stop and to look around and just see what's going on. Not all things happen really fast uh, when they come to God, especially. Uh, I know that uh, the Israelite people were slaves in Egypt for, well, they were in Egypt for 430 years, uh, several generations uh, of people that God uh, takes them while they're in slavery for 430 years and working out his promises. So that's a lot of generations who only ever knew slavery. Um, and so we know that God, as he works out uh, his, his plan um, throughout history and even throughout the, the short span of our lives, that he seems to be in no hurry. And sometimes that can become confusing to us because I think sometimes when we come to the greatness of Christ Jesus and who he is in our life, we feel like we've arrived to a place, a mountaintop place that will remain and we'll see all of God's promises come instantly on us. And, and life will be just a good and all the bad will be washed away. But what happens is that the journey with Christ continues to, to go and, and our life doesn't quite seem uh, what we thought it would be. And so we have to work these things out. We're going to look into scripture this morning. I pray that makes a, a little sense. We're going to look into scripture this morning. And I want to talk uh, first in, in our scripture in Genesis. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, God appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me. I'm going to make you exceedingly numerous. Many nations will come from you. Um, and so what God is saying, I'm going to make your family tree so big that they're going to continue to break away and make new groups of peoples. That your people will, will actually, you, from you, you will inherit the world. Like your people and your family tree will expand so much uh, uh, that you'll have many nations of people that come from you. The thing about it was Abraham was 99 years old uh, at this point. Uh, Sarah, I believe, was 10 years younger, if I'm right. So she was about 90 years old. And, and what I want to do is I want to go backwards a little bit because um, God very specifically says at this point, from Sarah, uh, this is going to happen. But I want to back up some because this is when Abraham is 99. And, and I want to go back uh, a, a little bit and I want to look at who Abraham is and I want to take a minute on this. Because Abraham is very essential to our, our, our Bible, uh, all throughout the Bible. Uh, Jesus speaks of Abraham. Paul speaks of Abraham. Abraham is found here in the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. And, and, and he's strung throughout. And uh, so I want to take a, a, some time today. I want to look at Abraham and who he is a, a little bit. Abraham is maybe kind of a thread that pulls some, some, some loose things together. Uh, so here's what's kind of happening here. Note taker, it takes some notes, but I, I'm trying to fit a whole bunch in in a little bit of time, and somehow time, I pray the Lord will make it make sense in your heart and God will speak to you. We're going to go clear back to Adam real quick. So Adam was the first man created, right? God, God, God formed Adam, put him in the garden. Uh, God gives Adam Eve. 
They have two children. Uh, one child uh, kills the other, right? It becomes chaos in the world, which actually started after Adam and Eve ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil when they felt sin. Sin entered into the world. Well, they have uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain kills Abel. Um, they're sent from the garden, black from the garden, and they go out, and the world becomes a dark place at that time. So dark that God decides he's going to, he, he's regretted what he's done. He can't stand all the sin and the chaos and the hatred and the pain and suffering in the world. So he's, gonna, he's going to destroy the world, right? And so who does he find, though, on the world? He finds who? Noah. Noah. Okay, so somebody at least is following him. And I understand now, but it's encouraging that somebody, uh, that are making some sense. So Adam uh, and Eve, they sin. They begin to populate the world, but it becomes just a wicked place. So God decides he's going he's to destroy the, the, the world, but he finds Noah. And so he has Noah build this ark. And anybody who would want to be saved from God's destruction would get on the ark. But nobody takes a flight except for Noah and his three sons, his three sons' wives. There's eight of them all together, Noah and his wife. And so, so God does do that, saves Noah and his family. And so when, when the ark lands and the people of the earth are destroyed, God is starting over with Noah. Noah has three children, Shem, Ham, and, and Japheth. And so I always say their name, I'm not sure that's right. And so God begins to populate the earth again. And through Shem, one of Noah's sons, um, about 420 some years later comes Abraham. Okay? Um, but in the midst of this is the Tower of Babel. You know, all the, so Noah and Noah's descendants are uh, going out into the, to the world. And they just become a scattered people. And so all of a sudden, God decides, I don't know if it's all of a sudden, but it, it appears, God says, okay, now I'm going to bring myself into the story. I want the people of the world to know that I'm their creator and that I love them and that I want a relationship with them, all of them. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to choose somebody. And through that somebody, I'm going to reveal myself, who I am, my character, what my plan is. And, and, and through their family, I'm going to uh, let the people of the world know who I am so they can come into a right relationship with me. So God chooses Abram. His name's Abram at the time, which means uh, uh, a great father. Uh, and so God chooses Abram and says, Abram, from you, I'm going to make many nations. But Abram is 75 at the time. And he's living with his father and his brothers, his uh, uh, nieces, nephews, in a place called Haran. And, and so he's 75 though at this time. And, and, and so his father dies and, and Abraham is sent to go down and move. So he's asked to leave his family and move. And so, and he, but he's got this great promise that through him is going to become a great nation. But he's 75 years old. So he travels down to this land that God had promised him. Oh. And when he gets there, he, he sees the land and says, okay, well, this is where God said me and my great nations of people are going to live, right? But how many children does he have at this time? Zero. And he's 75 at this time. When he goes down to this land that God's going to give him and his big family, but guess what happens? A famine comes. Okay. So they have to go down into Egypt. And, and so they flee down into Egypt and they go and they stay there for a little while. But in the midst of their time in Egypt, um, the king sees Sarah, uh, who is Abraham's wife, and Abraham realizes all these people in Egypt really like my wife, so he lies in a sense and says she's my sister, which she kind of actually was. Um, and so the king takes Sarah, and, and he's going to you know, take her as his wife, but before that happens, there's a big plague. And all the king's uh, uh, people in Egypt are, are, are hit with this plague. And, and then he finally said, he sees Abraham and Sarah together at one point, And he says, that's really your wife, isn't it? Why'd you lie to me? You about destroyed all my people. I know this is a lot of confusing stuff, right? And it's kind of supposed to be. Um, and so, so, so the king says, well, I'm not going to kill you or your wife or anything. But I'm going to send you back out of here. So they get kicked out of Egypt. And time is ticking, right? Years are going by. 
What about this great nation? What about this great promise? What about this land we're going to live in? And so they, they get kind of kicked out of Egypt. And, and during that time, um, Abraham had t taken his nephew with him uh, because his brother had died. And so he took his nephew when he originally left. And they had all of these people, though. His nephew must have been multiplying and they had all this stuff. But all of a sudden, nephew says, Abraham, I got to go. Where there's too many of us. And so they separate. Lot goes to Sodom and Gomorrah. You might remember this. And then Abraham's kind of left there with his wife. He's still childless. And, and uh, so instead of becoming more people, they become less people. Uh, so when Abraham is like 85, it's been about 10 years now. Sarah says, look, or Abraham says, look, we have no children. And we're supposed to be filling up this space, this land that we live in. What are we going to do? And this is where it might come in a little bit into marriage. Get on some marriage things that could be, uh, uh, I, I was kind of asked in a Sunday school class, or maybe a little joke would be, what are you going to teach on marriage? Obviously, I'm not married. I've been married. And, uh, uh, but I, I, I believe that the scripture here talks maybe some uh, to that, to where when... Ten years after God had given Abraham that promise, there's still no child from Sarah. And nobody knows what's going on. And all of a sudden they decide what they're going to do is take Sarah's slave girl, who was Egyptian, by the way. So maybe they picked her up while they were there. I don't know. And they're going to have a child maybe through her. At what point in your marriage, you know, when you're really trying to have a child, and even when you feel like God has promised you that child, and things just aren't happening, it's ten years later, you've been through a famine, you've been through a plague and somewhere else, you've been through a separation of family, you've left everything to, be, to begin with to follow this call of God in your life, and it's ten years later, and here you are with your wife, your, your child left, and you're thinking about having uh, maybe a segregate a mother, even though uh, Abraham was going to be a part of this. But you're thinking about, man, what do we do? A lot of confusion. You know, I didn't think it was going to look like this, right? I thought we were going to leave our family, come down into this new land, populate, you know, and, and it just hasn't looked like that at all. So now, so Abraham and Sarah decide they're going to do this. So Abraham goes to be with Sarah's slave girl, the one that would work for her. And she bears a, a child. She gets pregnant. After she finds out she's pregnant, she starts hounding on Sarah, starts mocking at her, starts treating her mean. So now the, the slave girl begins to treat her, her mistress, uh, Abraham's mistress, uh, wrongly. But she has this child, so that kind of makes her indisposable. And now Sarah's going through this crushed spirit. So now the wife is, is unhappy. Abraham's confused. Uh, you have a, a, a mother of a child uh, from this from uh, Hagar. What is going on, right? And so Hagar actually gives birth to Ishmael. And um, and one interesting thing about Ishmael, that's who the, the Muslim people, the Muslim faith right now, take their roots back to this Abraham's son, Ishmael. See, God blessed Ishmael. God, uh, Ishmael was Abraham's first son, but through the slave girl. And God blessed Ishmael. Ishmael had 12 sons who became 12 princes. And from their descendants, uh, come, uh, it comes through the Muslim, uh, is where the Muslim faith would actually take their teachings back to, which is why Abraham is so important in the Muslim faith. Now, this is interesting. Uh, and so, but God, but God says, God finally steps back. I'm not saying he's been out of the picture by any means, because he hasn't. He speaks to Hagar. Hagar runs away at one point, and God speaks to her and says, go back. I see you. I love you. I'm going to bless your son. And so God actually even loves and blesses Hagar. And so she goes back, has the child. There's ten more years that go by before God actually... Uh, uh, has Sarah bear a child. So, so, so Hagar's son Ishmael is like 11 years old when Sarah finally gives birth. God pops in a few times and says, Abraham, I'm really going to do this. You know, 10 more years go by 
God says, no, Abraham, I'm really going to do this. And at this point, the scripture we had this morning says, through Sarah, this is going to happen. Sarah is going to be the one to bear the child. Sarah laughs. She's like, we've been trying uh, at least for the last, what, 10, 20, 30 years. 30 years since God had given the promise. 30 years. And who knows how long they were trying to have children before that. So 30 years goes past. And they still have zero children. But God pops back in when Abraham is 99 uh, and Sarah is 90. And God says, this is really going to happen through Sarah. And so God says this. If, if we would to underline these words, God said, I am God Almighty. This is what he says to Abraham in our scripture today. I will make the covenant. I will make you exceedingly numerous. I will make you exceedingly fruit, fruitful. I will make nations. I will establish. I will bless Sarah. She will bring forth a child. God says, I will do these things. I will do these things. Have you ever felt like you had a, a, a call from God? And when you got the call, it was okay because you, weren't, you were just being yourself. But then once you got a call from God, maybe you felt a pressure on your life to be somebody like you hadn't been before. Like, oh my gosh, now that I have this call in my life, I got to be somebody different, right? I got to all of a sudden, I got to be, you know, perfect or, or, or whatever. And it's hard to be yourself anymore. Does anybody ever relate to that at all? Yeah, yeah. Like, all, like you're, you're just yourself and God says, I want to use you. But then once he says, I want to use you to do something... Then you freeze up, like, oh my gosh, now there's this pressure on me to be really good. And so, I can only imagine Abraham uh, and Sarah, as they went through all of this 30 years of promise, they're going to be a great nation. Um, but, but boy, what all have they done? Abraham lies, you know, kind of about Sarah, and he gets fearful, and says, oh, she's my sister, and almost lets somebody else take her to be wife. Uh, they have a broken up family. They go through a famine. They, they leave the land they were promised. Uh, you know, they have a, a child. Of, you know, they kind of construed something together to have a child another way. Can you imagine the failure of Abraham to, to maybe feel like, I've blown it, right? I've blown God's call in my life. God is no way pleased to use me anymore. Because after he called me, Look at all this stuff I've done. I, I messed it all up. I made the waters, all kinds of money. Does this make any sense? And maybe in your life that God has called us and sometimes we don't feel like we're doing a very good job of it. We know he's called us to do something. Uh, and, and we're trying to walk that out. But in the midst of that, we know we do all kinds of things that just don't make sense. And we know are like, God, I, I'm sure you just aren't interested in using me anymore. But, but God said this in our scripture. God said, I will and I am going to do these things. I'm going to be the one to fulfill them. And the scripture tells us this one thing. Uh, Paul puts it like this. Uh, so in our, our second reading, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all this. I'm going to try to wrap this up a little bit. And I pray God helps us make some sense out of it. Paul says it like this. Paul knew about Abraham. And Paul says it like this. Paul said that the promise uh, did not come to Abraham because Abraham, uh, because of the law, which means God didn't choose Abraham because Abraham was perfect. God chose Abraham because Abraham was willing to believe God. Willing to believe God. And, and, and Paul puts it in an incredible way uh, that, uh, that he said, he said, hoping against all hope, Abraham believed. Abraham believed against everything. Abraham believed after, after uh, 30 years and after a family breakup and after famine and after, uh, uh, after having a, a child with somebody else and all of these things, Abraham still believed God was going to keep his promise. That's what Paul tells us. Paul, that's what Paul tells us. Abraham believed and since he believed God, it says this in, in Romans chapter 4, it says, He did not consider his own body, the weakness of his own body. He did not consider the barrenness of Sarah's womb. It says that uh, even no distrust made him stop believing that God was somehow was going to fulfill what God said he was going to do. 
So even in the midst of all the chaos, Abraham still believed God was going to fulfill this promise. And Paul tells us that is what God was pleased with in Abraham. Is that Abraham still believed. Um, 1, John, uh, 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 1 John tells us this. John tells us this, that even when our own hearts convict us, God is still greater than our own hearts. So when we get in these uh, positions, uh, it says that faith is what, uh, faith was considered by God to Abraham as what made Abraham right with God, his faith. Paul says it's, if it was by the law, by Abraham being really good and figuring everything out, we wouldn't even need faith. But he says faith is what made Abraham right with God. And then Paul goes on to say this and speaks directly to us. And he said, oh, he, he says, now the words that Abraham was made right with God through faith were written not for his sake but for ours. Because we will be reckoned uh, righteous with God if we believe that, I'm going to read the words straight from the scripture. If we believe in him who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead, who handed him over to death for our transgressions and raised him to life for our justification. So we have this promise made by God. I'm wrapping up right now. We have this promise made by God to us that, that he sent his son into the world to take all of our punishment upon himself, which is why he came, which was in our opening prayer this morning. He was an instrument, a vessel of shame. He was sent here to be put to shame in your place and in my place. All of our shame, all of our guilt, all of our screw-ups, all of the things like we could maybe relate to Abraham. Like, well, I thought life was going to work like this, and then I did this, and I did this, and I made a big mess out of everything. And, and so it says all of that was placed on Christ. And then when Christ took all of that shame to the cross and died in our place, suffered all of our shame... For us, so that we don't have to carry all those mistakes around with us. Even when our own hearts say, look at what you've done, look at what a mess you made. We can say, I still believe God took all of that. I still believe Jesus took all that for me. And I believe he died in my death for me. And I believe he raised to new life to assure me that I have new life in him. So I guess the point of, the, uh, of what has been on my heart this week, there's so much chaos uh, that goes on. And in the midst of that, if we're relying on our own selves to be good enough to be right with God, we're, we're always going to be a mess. But if we're willing to believe that in the midst of our life and what it is and what we thought it would be, uh, in the midst of all that, if we're willing to say, God, in the midst of everything going on, I still believe that you sent your son into the world to take my punishment, to take my shame. You sent him into the world to die my death. You rose him to the light to assure me that it's true. I still believe, Lord, that you completely saved me, just as you promised to do. It says that's what uh, Abraham had. He had that faith that said, I believe God's going to do what he said he was going to do, regardless of everything else. The scriptures say this, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this. The scriptures say, uh, he who began a good work in you will Work it to completion. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God who began a good work in you will work that good work to completion in you regardless of all of your this? Regardless of all the misdecisions? Regardless of the confusion? That God will complete that good work in you? He will do it. And we ask him to help us trust that he will and live in that peace and freedom. Let's pray together this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we know that you call us. We, we've heard your voice in some way, or we felt your presence in some way. Lord, you've spoke to us somehow in life, and, and uh, we don't always know exactly what it means. We begin to head in one direction, and next thing we know, uh, you know, we think it's the way you're telling us to go, and then next thing we hit a, a dead end or a curve or uh, and we just, we're not sure what's going on. Lord, sometimes we just begin to question whether 
uh, you know, what's going on? Have you really called us? Have we heard your voice? Have we messed it up? Have you left us? Have you become displeased in us? Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, and we know, uh, Heavenly Father, though, that your word says uh, that you, you've given your very own son for us. And so what good thing would you uh, hold back? And the answer is nothing. You would never hold any good thing back. Uh, so, Lord, that we, we thank you so much for Abraham. We thank you so much for Sarah. We thank you so much even for uh, Hagar and Ishmael. Uh, Lord, they're all a part of your story. Uh, that help us to relate to, to who you are because we can relate to who they are. We can relate to the confusions. Uh, we can also relate to people that have your promise and, and just, uh, Lord, aren't sure what to do with you except hold on to the promise that you are the one. You are the one who says you will and you are the one who will complete your promises in our life, Lord, that you will continue to draw us closer to you until we see your face, uh, Lord, in eternity, uh, because of what you've done for us through your son, Jesus. Uh, Lord, help us to continue to just trust in you, to work out your plan in our life. And may we always give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.